Good afternoon. Welcome to today's uh, International Women's Day. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, allow us to give a few minutes just to have a, a few more people to join and then we'll be able to start. So for those joining us, um, this is to let you know that there is interpretation uh, services. We have interpreters uh, uh, to Portuguese, uh, French, um, Arabic, and Somalia. Uh, if you want to get to your room, uh, there's um, a globe icon on the right uh, side of your screen. If you click on it, you should be able to see uh, different languages. You can select the language that uh, fits you and remember to, uh, um, uh, to unmute the English if you don't want to hear both languages at the same time. So once again, welcome to Women's Day uh, celebrations. My name is Jael Amati, Agenda Specialist at uh, ICF. Um, I'm happy to be moderating this session. And so as we start, allow me to uh, share um, en our engagement approach. We'll have around one and a half hours uh, together. And so for those who did not hear about the interpretation services, we have interpreters in different rooms uh, in, in, in Arabic, in Somalia, French and Portuguese. So you should, uh, if, if you want to, uh, to interpretation, um, select uh, the interpretation icon on your screen. Uh, you should be able to see the different languages, select the language that you uh, you want and uh, unmute English in case you do not want to um, hear both languages at the same time. Um, secondly, uh, we'll all have an opportunity to uh, engage. Uh, the audience will not be able to, the, you'll not be able to speak uh, directly, but this a Q and A um, um, a section on your on your screen again. If you click on it, you should be able to uh, engage us. Feel free to ask a question. Feel free to share your opinions about today, and feel free also to give recommendations uh, using the using the Q and A uh, session. 
Uh, in terms of the program, uh, we, as I mentioned to those who came earlier, we have one and a half hours together. And so uh, at the beginning, we'll have an opening uh, uh, remark from uh, AECF um, Chief Executive Officer. We'll also have um, a keynote speech from one of our digital and business experts. Um, we'll have a, a panel discussion. And at that point, uh, once we are done with the panel discussion, uh, we'll be able to, um, uh, to engage uh, with your questions. So at that point, we'll be able to read out the questions and the panelists will be able to respond to them. Um, we'll then move to the next session, which is the launch of our um, uh, uh, Quancy program, which is a scaling uh, women uh, in business program. Um, we are opening up a new call, so you should be able to listen to it and those uh, that have not been part of it have an opportunity to actually register and, and be part of it. Um, thank you so much. At this point, allow me to give an opportunity to our CEO, Madam Victoria uh, Savula, who will uh, give an opening remark. Thank you so much, uh, Jail, and please bear with me for whatever background noise you'll experience. Uh, the building uh, just uh, uh, went off power a few minutes ago. Uh, thank you for joining us and being a part of our community. We value you. At AECF, we live and breathe gender equity. We have been at this for the longest time. And beyond accounting for gender norms in our processes and seeing how to compensate for gender-based inequalities through gender-integrated programming, we have advanced towards gender-specific investments through having dedicated funding for women in business. You must have seen a lot of our work over the last year advertising for opportunities for women-led and women-owned businesses. We also have been intentionally developing women leaders because we know that women lead differently. And we want for Africa's women entrepreneurs to be able to lead in a manner that will actually power themselves and of course their businesses. We are now investing through financial intermediaries, looking at how we actually support the entirety of the ecosystem of entrepreneurs from the medium enterprises to the small enterprises to the micro so that no women woman business is left um, behind. We have lately launched the ACF Academy and some of you are joining us today have been participants in the Nkwanzi program cohort one. Today we launched cohort two and it's really about providing a platform through which businesses can be investor ready and tailored specifically for women in business. We are living in the information age and how appropriate that actually this year's theme for International Women's Day is digital, which is really about everybody being included, innovation and technology for gender equality. It is so critical that every woman in business has access to empowerment enablers and tech is up there given the statistics that we see around. But then even as we celebrate uh, digital technology and what it has done you know, across the globe, we know that Africa is way behind and that means African businesses are behind even further women led um, businesses. Look at an entrepreneur in San Francisco today who has a lot of digital platforms, uh, possibilities, and whatever resources are put um, in place for the reason of the advancement in those uh, geographies, whether you're talking about marketing platforms and uh, Amazon, Alibaba, Alipay, whatever that looks like, uh, content creation platforms, whether it is uh, Canva, Pinterest, all of that that is not necessarily available in the same measure in this other side um, of the world. But then we are making progress. I was just reading about how MPESA in Kenya has actually enabled for businesses to access credit. And uh, Amina, who is a grocery business owner, has been able to move from a turnover of $300 a month to a thousand a month, just because she can be able to access credit. She has credit uh, scoring, credit history that enables us to just advance in terms of ticket size. And now she can be able to borrow through an mshuary platform. She can deploy that payback and then continually advance really 
in her home, she's able to do more because she has better income. Amina is really an example of how digital can be able to enable small businesses. But then think about what she doesn't know. And as I was thinking about today, I just thought that there is so much out there that today's woman entrepreneur does not have access to because of an absence of you know, that information. They don't have the information that they need to leverage on that. And I really want to encourage us as the women who are here today, number one is women businesses that we actually be adopters of technology in our business, but also that we drive initiatives that will see more women have access to resources that will empower them. It is not helpful when there is so much that is out here, but it is not accessible to the people that require in order for them to make progress. It will take you and I, so please, let's take advantage so that we power off businesses, but also we get to power and present opportunities for other women that are seeking to advance through technology. I'm excited that we are having this conversation, that we have great women leaders, and then, of course, Fahad, who is um, a, a great inclusion leader speaking to us uh, today. And uh, please ask questions and engage as much as you can so that we take away from these experts uh, today. With that, I want to welcome Candy to uh, present uh, the keynote uh, remarks for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victoria. It is our day, ladies. It's a day for us to be happy. So happy International Women's Day. Yeah, so if I can see you on camera, at least smile so that I know I know we, we, we are celebrating, we are happy about it. And I am so honored to be here with you today, mostly because of where, how special Africa is, of course I'm African, and how special business is. Then to add on to that, how special tech is. So when we combine those three, today just feels like a day full of candy for me if I was a child. Like many of you, I embody various roles at any given time. When I woke up today, for example, despite the fact that I had a board meeting at 7 a.m., the first thing I did was to check if my youngest, Naitore, who will be eight soon, had left an alarming message for me on our collaboration page. You see, Naitore is the baby in the home. She's the only girl. She loves to get attention, especially from me, her mom. And she's the only girl, so I let her. I know, you must be thinking, did she just say collaboration and then daughter in the same sentence? You heard me right, I did. I've always had a traveling job. I love to work, but I particularly love being a mom to my children. Very early on, I had to figure out a way for us to remain in touch constantly, even when I'm not physically with them, which is how we started to use one of the collaboration tools as a family. So we have a family account, we monitor everything that goes on, and the child can come at any time and send a message and share how everything is. So when we speak, we've not left anything out. So even this week, because I'm not at home with them, I'm traveling, we use the same collaboration tool. Is in technology, if I just described to you one of the ways I use technology in my everyday, is in technology supposed to help us solve everyday problems? If it is, why then do we tend to limit its use cases? Why do we have so many of us complicating it when the fact is it is actually supposed to simplify our life? Today, we are going to discuss about leveraging innovation and technology for inclusive growth. We're going to discuss about using technology to drive equity, to move forward that needle, so that at least we are having equal opportunities presented across um, the divides. And where do we start? We have very few minutes, so I'll be very brief about this. I'm speaking to you, your founders, 
your leaders of your businesses, where do you start? How about we start with you as the leader? How are you using technology today? What role is tech playing to help you be a better leader? I am a student of John Maxwell. And what John Maxwell teaches is that a leader acts as a lead. And if you can see me, I'll show you. So assuming this is a bottle and this is a lead. So a leader acts as a lead or a cover, meaning to the level to which a leader is competent, the team can only come that far. Assuming we are working with competence in the scale of one to 10, and the leader is at 10, the team you're then leading can only be at nine or below. Therefore, it means if you're a leader and your competence level is at six, your team cannot scale beyond you. They will only be five and below. So my question is, as a leader, how are you using technology to help you be a better leader. I'll give you some examples you can look at. And hopefully when we are done, you can go and explore them and help yourself get to at least a 10 so that you can help your team also rise up and deliver for you. Online courses. We are Africans. What do we love? We love to go for formal uh, skilling. We want to go to class, we want to add another degree, we want to add an MBA. But my question is, how often do they revise the curriculum for that MBA class? How often do they revise the curriculum for that formal degree course? On online courses, there's the agility and it's the, it's the advancement that technology brings. There's the agility to keep refining as the times change for relevance. Some of the top institutions in the world, whether it's Harvard or MIT, they have online courses that are actually free and self-paced for the consumers of it. Right now, I checked today, on the Harvard site, there is 113 courses, which are free. You pay nothing. You self-pace yourself, and the topics range from anything to do with art and design to business and a business, the strategic leadership, pricing strategy, competitive risk, foundational principles of leadership, they are rich to computer science, which is the introduction to computer science, to development, to machine learning, to you know, artificial intelligence. There's even about education and teaching. Why am I saying this? There's a variety of resources, which if you choose to consume you as the leader, just because you're aiming to use tech as a tool, you will then better yourself. Statistics unfortunately show that even of, sort of those courses, Women consume them less than the men do. My challenge to you today, as you listen to me, will you please just take time? This link will be shared with you and just click it. I'm telling you, believe me, I checked today, 113 free courses. The other way you can help yourself as a leader using tech is through podcasts, listen to podcasts or audiobooks. Again, our lovely continent, it takes us time to commute. Maybe on average 30 minutes if you're lucky. For some, it's an hour, morning and evening, wherever you're going. If you're a business person and you're the one leading your business, you're going from meeting to meeting, it's even longer that you're in, those tra in that traffic situation. What do you do with that time? If you go jogging like some of us love to, what do you do? Do you listen to your podcasts? Do you listen to your audiobooks? Some of the podcasts that I love and I listen to and which would be relevant to you would be like one which says back to work, it's labeled back to work, which is the intersection of technology, work and people. As a leader, could you listen to this and learn how other people, other leaders around the world are using tech and how you can also scale. Another would be how, to, how we build um, to scale or masters of scale. So if you're starting a business, how do you ensure you're building it for it to scale? Again, very key information that you can use and which you can consume in the course of your day. So choose not to listen to the comedy that they play on radio, 
but then choose to actually use that time to listen to something that can help you be a better leader. Thank and you. That is Thank when... you. Thank you so much, Kendi. Indeed, Kendi is a storyteller and uh, we'll hear a lot, a lot in the next uh, panel discussion. Uh, allow me, Kendi, because I know you've gone deeper into that and we have another session. Uh, so uh, ca can we, can we, can we uh, defer that and just discuss during the panel discussion? Uh, thank you so much, Victoria, uh, for, for, for your speech. As you spoke, uh, one of the things I'm really proud about is to really work under you. And just seeing that by the end of this year, we're going to be bringing over 200 uh, women-led or women-owned businesses under your leadership. And some of those businesses could actually be represented here. So indeed, uh, you, you speak to your actions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kendi. Uh, Kendi is uh, actually the global head of misrepresentation at, 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 Met, at, at Meta, and we'll get to hear more about his coaching and the mentorship that she's been able to, um, uh, to, to carry out and, and discuss the opportunities, uh, the solutions, and to some of the challenges that we're actually experiencing uh, related to the uh, topic of today, which is um, digital uh, innovation. Uh, and technology for gender equality. How can we help women to be able to take advantage of it? Um, at this point, allow me to introduce to you the panel. Um, um, we on the panel we'll have uh, uh, we, we have four very influential uh, speakers. Uh, we'll have um, uh, Hodan Ali. Hodan is the executive director of uh, MicroDahab, a uh, microfinance institution in Somalia. Um, uh, Hodan, please go ahead and introduce yourself. And as you introduce yourself, please uh, let us know um, uh, what, uh, how this topic of today, embracing gender equality, how does it matter to you? Kindly unmute yourself, Hodan. We can't hear. Um, Hodan, uh, we can't hear you. Allow me to go to uh, Fahad. Are you okay now, Hodan? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, proceed. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Jael and ACF for organizing this event, which is really needed, and for trying to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, um, may have not thought that Somalia would be reached, uh, being in a, in a very, um, uh, in a place that most people think that there's no development. Uh, so I uh, thank you so much. My name is Sultan Ali. I'm the executive director at MicroDahab MFI, which is the leading microfinance institution in the Somali region. Um, especially uh, we work with to empower women, youth, and the productive sector, which is uh, unbanked uh, currently uh, in the Somali region. We've been operating for over uh, the past eight years and have uh, a large portfolio. And we are working currently with ACF on the financial inclusion and growth program to ensure that we can reach those unbanked communities uh, within the Somali region, especially those in the rural areas and especially focusing on the youth and the women. Digitalization is so, so important for, for our region uh, because basically the infrastructure is lacking. But because of the, uh, of the um, new technology available, we have skipped a lot of the uh, industrial revolution that has happened in other countries and moved straight to the uh, digital age, allowing us to uh, ensure that our clients can use mobile phones to access their finance and uh, access information uh, without them leaving their towns and their businesses. Um, I will uh, uh, elaborate later on, uh, but that's for my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hodan. And next we have um, Fahad Awadi. 
uh, who is the CEO and founder of YYTZ Agro Processing Plant in, in Tanzania. Fahad. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Fahad. I'm the founder, and I like to call myself the chief cashew officer at YYTZ. That just means that all I think about is cashews all day. I really look forward to this discussion around uh, digital technology and gender equity. Um, our business is the intersection between uh, global value chains, uh, value addition at origin on the continent and women empowerment. And I look forward to sharing how we are using technology within our value chain to empower women, uh, to help them move forward uh, in their lives. Thank you so much, Fahad. Uh, we have um, Hiksonia Nyasulu, who is um, board chair of AECF. Hiksonia. Thank you, Jahal. Um, let me let me start off by welcoming uh, everyone to this webinar of our investees, uh, development partners, my fellow panelists, uh, Victoria and yourself, and my my AECF colleagues, and everyone in fact who has joined the webinar. And happy International Women's Day to all of you. My name is Hexonia Nyasulu, and as I said, I am the chair of AECF but I'm also a board member of AGRA and also of Anglo-American uh, PLC. But my biggest and most important title is that I'm myself an entrepreneur and have been since 1984. I don't know how many people actually realize that the first international women's event was held on the 19th of March 1911, so that's 112 years ago. And it took 64 years. So only in 1975 did the United Nations actually recognize this. And now another 48 years later, it really pains me that we're still talking about equity for women despite 112 year history of International Women's Day. And it's an indictment on all of us and on society, quite frankly, that women are still on the short end of this digital divide. I'm conscious also not to take women and women entrepreneurs as one big homogenous group because they're not. In fact, a wise person once said, there's nothing more unequal than the equal treatment of unequals. And if you understood that the first time, you're cleverer than me because it took me quite a while to understand it. But essentially what it, it means is that there are inequalities, not only amongst men and women, but inequalities amongst women themselves, which are brought about by different educational backgrounds and particularly in the digital transformation space. Education plays a role in how others are more advantaged than others, whether you're in an urban area or rural area, whether you're in a developing country or a developed country or an advanced country, and also cultural differences play a role in the extent to which some people have access to, to digital uh, technologies than others. We know that COVID-19 actually uh, made the situation even worse. So all those who had access to digital technologies were able to pivot so much quicker than the others and the others were left behind and are still struggling to cope. Starting a business itself, in fact, is almost impossible if we're being honest without digital tools because there are regulatory requirements that are all the forms that you have to fill. And anyone who lives in Africa like me knows what a nightmare it is to go to government offices. So if you had access as a woman to dig digital tools that allowed you for, to fill in forms, to gather information on the things that you want to deal with, it really would make life very simple for people. And yet we know that there are 250 million more men who use the internet than women. And 
there are so many barriers to women and, and the lack of digital know-how is one of those barriers. The uh, lack of finance to acquire digital tools is a big barrier for women. The unaffordable internet access costs. And yet there are also cultural barriers where fathers and husbands do not want daughters and women to have access to what they consider tools that will lead them astray. So a very big challenge for women. And, and you know, we know that better access to technology increases uh, the ability of people to compete more globally. And so the fact that women are disadvantaged in that area is, is, a, is a huge problem. But let's not forget and let's not shy away from the fact that one of the other biggest barriers is that women fear technology. And I know even as a young graduate coming into a marketing background, that simple technology like operating the video uh, equipment in that day, actually, if there was a little glitch, what we would all say is, I'll get one of the guys to come and help me. And it's things like those that have held us back as women, the fear of breaking things, the fear of you know, being blamed for something going wrong, which men do not have. And if something breaks, a man will just say, oops, you know, what happened? What did I just do? And figure out a solution to that. I'd like to deal about some of the, uh, you know, why digital transformation pathways are important, but I'm gonna be guided by you, uh, Madam Chair, as to whether you want me to do it now or in the general. I think, I think since you've started Hicksonia, uh, okay. I'll request that you, you proceed and that I speak, keep going. Yes, okay. speak to your experiences while starting your, um, the first women-led uh, investment vehicle in South Africa. What kind of stereotypes did you, uh, did you experience? And from where you sit uh, as, as a global leader, also look at um, um, how... Um, you know, adoption, how can women entrepreneurs set out uh, on a digital transformation path, you know, right. from, you, from your experiences? So, so thank you for that question. Um, one of the challenges that I was having to face starting a business was really skepticism about whether a woman, and I was 29 at that age, a woman of my age, in not just a male dominated environment in South Africa, but one divided around, along racial lines, whether you, know, you would have the capability to consult to bid, big corporates uh, with, with uh, where you were coming from. So one of the biggest ways to really get around those challenges, first of all, was to ensure that I armed myself with up-to-date knowledge and information that I was an expert in the area that I wanted to consult in and that I had the tools necessary. And, and people will laugh when I say, for me, the first technological tool uh, that was important in those days was just how the answering machine was a game changer, simple as it was in those days. The fax machine, really improved uh, my efficiency because I didn't have to be running to places. I could leave the office and go do presentations because there was an answering machine and an effects machine to be able to send things, things through. But better cash flows because people, your clients were no longer using checks but they could pay you, they can pay you instantly, really made a difference uh, by having access to those kinds of things. And today, the fact that I can use technology to pitch uh, for business, for, to pitch for, for, for stakes, private equity stakes through PowerPoint presentations, rather than putting a paper presentation in a briefcase, and taking all of that time to go on a roadshow to see people has really transformed the way that we do business. The ability to hotspot means that you're not rushing 
back to an office to be close to internet connectivity, that if you have a device such as a mobile phone and you have a device such as a, an iPad, you can have a video conference in your car and blur your, your uh, background using technology the way that I have and hotspot your phone without needing to get close to digital technology. But we know that many women don't have access to that. And, and that's what really pulls women back. The fact that they you know, do not have the technology to give them information that gives them the ability to scan the environment, look at what their competitors are doing, which is the advantage that I have had in my space is I'm able at the touch of a button to, to educate myself on the sectors in which I want to do business, but not just that, to have information to things like the Harvard Business Review, which give you access to mega trends. So when you speak to customers, when you speak to clients, when you're pitching for business, you have up-to-date in information on your fingertips. So thanks, for thanks, me, this Sonia. digital transformation has been extremely important for my business. Could, could you mention a bit on how do we get women to a digital transformation path? Maybe just one or two points. How do we sort out this, uh, this, this gender divide in digital access? Jal, if I had my way, the 100, 1.7 billion women that don't have cell phones, I put a cell phone and a smartphone in every woman's hand. But not only that, I would put together workshops and webinars such as this specifically on upskilling them on how to use technology. For instance, women who are able to promote their businesses on TikTok, on Pinterest, on, on, on uh, um, Instagram are way ahead of everybody else who needs to make the journey to go meet with clients and to, to, uh, to showcase their businesses. So it's important for the AECF and our development partners, and I hope they are listening, to ensure that women do have the hard uh, hard equipment and the soft equipment and the digital tools that they require, but also to arm them with training and, and, and exposure to all the things that are available now um, so that they are trained to promote their businesses, but also to run and operationalize their businesses digitally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. And uh... I was just looking through your, your, your work and even how you, you, you're using the digital space and your program on um, the power, you know, the hedge. Hedge to the power of you. To the yes. power of you. I didn't it's mention quite... that one. For instance, what that did for me was the hundreds of workshops that I would need to run and the one-to-one -one mentor was suddenly taken away because I could put a 13-part series uh, of age to the power of you, which is business leadership, uh, information and knowledge and know-how, uh, where people can reach it uh, on demand at their own time and at their leisure. If I didn't have the digital platform, I would have had to run workshops, which is which is a time-consuming thing. Now here I am sitting with you now, and even as we speak. 20 people could be accessing that on, on the website and, and choosing the information and, and the leadership course that they Thank want you. access to. Thank you so much, uh, Hicksonia. And Hicksonia is also a uh, non-executive director of Anglo-American. Uh, check her out on her LinkedIn. Check her out on uh, H to the Power of You uh, videos to get to know more about her. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Hicksonia. We really appreciate. Let's get to Hodan. Hodan, uh, you are the you are the executive director of uh, Micro Dahab Microfinance um, in a very uh, fragile uh, society. Uh, just checked, uh, Somalia has about sixteen uh, million people. Out of this uh, sixteen million, actually 
uh, only around 2.5 million actually live in the urban centers, meaning that a lot of your customers, a lot of the people that you're reaching out to are actually living in the rural areas. Maybe could you uh, just uh, uh, share with us how you've been able to make use of the digital to be able to um, access and reach out, um, bring about gender uh, equity and bring on board the most marginalized people uh, to the banking sector? Uh, you so, need to. Yes, I need to myself. So thank you so much, Al. Uh, yes. So Somalia is in the uh, is is. In... You are muted again. Kindly unmute. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we are in a post-conflict area, um, and so the interesting thing is that uh, Somalis, by nature, they are very entrepreneurial, uh, and um, even those. Uh, female entrepreneurs, and no matter how small their business is, uh, are always looking to see how they can ensure that they can feed their children, ensure that they um, keep the family going. Um, and but the challenge is still that uh, the lack of lack of information, and ensuring that get, that they get the same information as as uh, other male entrepreneurs. And for us, as a basic, uh, as a phone, a basic uh, phone, not a smartphone, what we have used is the uh, USSD code that clients, we can interact with clients, we send them messages uh, to provide them information on uh, the loans that they can get, which are as, as small as uh, $100. And um, basically what they can do is you can send us a basic text back saying yes or no. And if they're interested, um, one of our, our uh, call centers will contact them to speak to them. So instead of the, our uh, employees traveling all the way to the rural areas, uh, they can be based in one of the major cities and call them back, explain to them uh, what kind of products we have available and how how they can get access to finance. So without them traveling all the way to the city, without them um, uh, you know missing time, uh, taking time away from their businesses, which is very essential. Because as you know, the, turn, uh, the turnover for micro small businesses is very small. So if you take some time out of your business, it is going to be a, a direct loss, which is uh, impacting uh, our clients. Um, furthermore, what we have also done is um, uh, radio podcasts. So radio is the main uh, source of information that um, most uh, female entrepreneurs use to get access to information. Um, they don't have time for TV, um, and social media is yet um, it's mostly used by the youth, by the uh, young um, uh, the youth below 25 uh, female entrepreneurs. But the majority of them listen to the radio, so informing them about our services, how they can reach us, and again our call center because it's still a very uh, uh, communicate very communicative. So they that, like it's a verbal. Uh, society, society. So once you pass the information on to uh, a few clients within that uh, area, they will themselves then pass that information on, which is very important. Um, so we're not actually uh, uh, getting a lot of expense um, uh, by you know sending flyers and leaflets and so on, but it's like direct communication with them. And then uh, the most important is that we have seen clients grow the businesses uh, for starting from small home as $100 and then moving on to uh, up to $5,000. Um, and the interesting thing is also is that um, once would they have seen how successful they have become, the community, the entrepreneurs within the community, the female entrepreneurs within the own community will come to our clients and say, okay, I have seen your business grow. Please tell me how did you do, where do you get this access to finance? And then they will pass on that information, which is very crucial Furthermore, what we do is also we, we work with uh, local universities and colleges and spread the word around because um, those young girls who are in university, they have mothers who, of course, are running businesses so that they also pass on the information. And what we also use, of course, our social media platform to reach the youth because the youth are also um, uh, at the moment, they are the ones who are mostly using social media and then they inform their uh, their mothers about what's going on uh, when it comes to access to finance. That does not mean there is lack, um, that there are still no, uh, that there are a lot of challenges. The challenges that we have is that most people, most uh, investors, um, when they think about Somalia, they think that, uh, you know, people are not really um, uh, uh, get, um, getting, uh, no, borrowing. 
uh, it's because there's a lack of uh, you know lack of, uh, lack of funds within the within the country. Most banks and micro uh, before the microfinance institution came uh, within uh, Somalia, they are focusing on trade. So uh, uh, you can start about loans above fifty thousand and above, which were only having impact on twenty percent of the of the community. Uh, within the Somali region. So when, as soon as microfinance institutions entered the market, um, we saw this massive uptake within the unbanked community, which is very essential. And uh, especially for the youth, um, whether we talk about the youth as uh, female entrepreneurs or, 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 or male entrepreneurs, um, as soon as they saw that they were able to upskill their business or start businesses, they were able to get loans from us and other, other microfinance institutions within, within the region. And the lucky, we are very lucky that everybody has access uh, to e-wallets. Yeah? Yeah. So through e-wallets, we can pay the vendors uh, directly and so that our customers can um, get the goods directly from the place that they want to purchase the goods for. So eWorld has been uh, very massive. It also has de-risk um, uh, fraud from our side because we can see exactly where the funds have gone to. And another opportunity that our eWallet, which is within our company, uh, the eWallet also provides um, entrepreneurs to repay back the loans directly to the wallet. So instead of them, they don't have to travel. They don't have to take the risk of carrying money with them and traveling uh, with money to our offices. They can just literally just send it to our uh, e-wallet account and we should give them also a statement. They can, in any day of the of the week, they can review the statement, see also um, how much uh, uh, loan of their loan has been repaid. And if once they finish their loan, they also get a message that they can reapply for another loan. So we and, are and, very- and Hodan Yes. Is is the, is the e-wallet uh, accessible across the country? Yes, it's uh, e-wallet is very accessible. Uh, it's not an app. It's not an app application. There's an app application, but it's also a USSD form. And for us, uh, for the micro uh, small businesses, we use the USSD code because that's really basically straightforward. Yes, they just have to basically tap in, you know, uh, the account number and then and then their PIN code, and then they can see either withdraw funds deposit or pay loans yes so it's very straightforward it's not a fancy app where you have to you know like uh do a lot of complicated things we try to keep it as simple as as, as possible this is because we are dealing with the unbanked uh, community yes our, the bank our bank we have also a bank which is called the Hapshield bank that one focuses more on the trade and then the traders will have a, a very fancy app where they could do a lot of uh, things on it, but with us, we try to keep it as simple as possible because you don't want to make we don't want to uh, make it too difficult for clients to use uh, our e-wallet. So straightforward, keep it simple. As uh, I think, as the, as the lady before me said, you have to keep it simple so that at the end user, at the end of they can use it, and 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 it's it's um it's accessible to them. So for us, that has really worked. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hodan, for the work you're doing. And, and you know, for example, that services, for example, it's being provided by, by, by one company. And one of the things we hope for is that we can have, you know, we can move away from the monopoly and move away uh, to having more companies being able to provide some kind of services. Uh, Antonio uh, Guterres, the head of UN, really surprised us recently uh, to the eve of the CS to the to the eve of, uh, of this day, and he mentioned that it will take about 300 years for us to be able to achieve uh, gender equality. Oh. I don't know whether he was just exaggerating, but that shows how much more uh, is required for us to be able to achieve. And of course, now today we're talking about access to digital um, uh, digital space, uh, a way that we can use to be able to close the gender gap. Thank you so much, uh, Hodan, for the work that you're doing. Uh, let's come to Fahad. Um, Fahad, as, uh, as Victoria mentioned, you actually are a young entrepreneur and you actually manage to enhance inclusion in, in the, in the Kashonat uh, value chain in, 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 in Tanzania and with a lot, and of course, with a lot of connection. Uh, so you have a warehouse in, in Canada and, you know, you're doing really, really a lot. From your perspective, uh, maybe uh, could you just uh, help us understand what's your view in, in for example, um, what is your view in the business case of digital innovation and what has been your experience leveraging technology for your company? You know, 
talk about how transform, uh, transformative uh, if at all uh, there has been um, digitization uh, been in terms of creating opportunities for women and girls and bridging the gender divide. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jill. So we set out to build a very inclusive value chain around cashew nuts in Tanzania. And inclusivity uh, meant one, working directly with smallholder farmers, uh, working to include them in the value addition process and ensuring more value reaches those communities in those rural areas. And the other was uh, inclusivity in terms of ensuring that women also had access and upward mobility within this value chain. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, I, I think uh, some of the other speakers also echoed similar sentiments that women are very entrepreneurial. They carry the responsibility of taking care of their families. And we found this in the cashew nut value chain that women were actively looking for ways to add value to their own cashews. The thing that they struggled with was access to a secure market. And that's where we saw that our role uh, could be. Uh, in terms of technology, so over 65% of uh, our farmers are women. Uh, and we've used technology to underpin the entire value chain uh, from registering farmers, digitizing receive receipts of uh, cashew nuts from farmers, and then finally digitizing the payments directly to each individual farmer's uh, mobile wallet or bank account to ensure that the proceeds from their work actually goes to them and that they are the ones that end up benefiting. Um, and the goal has been, you know, kind of threefold in terms of, you know, increasing upward mobility for women within the value chain through technology, not just digital technology, but also small equipment, small machinery that allows them to be more efficient and I don't know how many of you have seen cashew nuts, but this is a cashew nut um, from Tanzania. And what we do is we help women to remove the shell from their own cashews. Uh, today, unfortunately, most of the cashews produced in Africa are going to India or Vietnam for processing. And we wanted to bring that value back to the continent, but also making sure that the farmers and the women in those communities were actually able to benefit directly. By, allow by helping them to remove the shell, we're also able to pay them premium prices. So we pay them over 60% more than if they were to sell these raw cashews into traditional markets. Uh, and then the third is really just transparency. So visibility on pricing, market pricing, they're able to see what the market price is. They have access to that knowledge, which I think we heard also earlier. Um, and then also now uh, the ability for them to sell directly to us, uh, register themselves and receive those payments directly into their bank or their mobile wallet. Um, and the other part of this value chain that we really looked at was the consumer facing side. Uh, Cashew is a very opaque, uh, value chain. Uh, most of the cashews are grown in Africa today, but most consumers have no idea where they are grown or by whom they are grown. And so we've worked to develop a traceability system and build that into our products, which now allows a consumer to scan a QR code using blockchain technology, and they can see which women's group that particular pack of cashews came from. So we want to create transparency, and uh, the ability to empower farmers, not just at the rural level, but also from a consumer's perspective. I think the end goal of this is having a final consumer be able to actually uh, hit a farmer because they enjoyed those cashews uh, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Wadi, for being a gender champion. And we look at the number of, uh, you know, employment you've been able to create, especially for women through your, through the company. And it's quite amazing. And we will please remain a gender champion in the space. So at this time, um, we have a few minutes left, uh, but this doesn't limit you, Candy. Uh, kindly uh, summarize the, the session for us by really now getting to the solution um, 
because of your storytelling skills, what does a good uh, story, uh, what does a good digital story uh, telling really look like? Uh, I think one of the things I receive, one of the issues I received from women is that, you know, they're always told to uh, tell the stories of their businesses. And this is not their thing. And I think it's an opportunity to really uh, maybe build their, their ability and, and just share some insights, uh, insights on this. Uh, thank you, Jal. And I know we are tight for time. So what I've done on the link, I have shared resources for businesses. Um, just to call it out, I know one of the uh, the speakers, I think it was the chair, Hicksonia, she did mention that how much more can businesses that are in Instagram or TikTok or whatever in social media, how much more can they do? So some of the resources I've shared is how the businesses, um, the women in this call can access the resources that would help them at least gain the digital platform or the journey to that. Uh, just go through that. It is self-tutoring. It is self-explanatory. You can take advantage of it. Uh, the other resource I have shared is all from, uh, what I've shared is from Meta. I work for Meta, so that was a priority. Then the other um, that I've shared is for, from Google. And what Google, Google has um, a founders, a black founders application that they are rolling out, which is closing on 26th of March. And what they want is women, uh, black founders operating in Africa to apply. So there are cash grants in it. There's mentorship, there's product development. Um, take advantage of that. Again, I have shared the link for you to utilize. And now to the question that you asked about stories, um, what can businesses do? Uh, I know you said earlier, Jal, that I'm a storyteller. It is true. And the reason I adopt storytelling or the reason I have seen different businesses around the world do very well with storytelling is because stories help you, the founder, you, the entrepreneur, bring people along your journey. They help you understand you better, which then builds empathy and they can then buy into your vision. Stories help you and answer your why. Why do you do what you do? Why is it important to you? You check for each founder, especially the successful founders, which you are for you to be in this call. There's a reason you started the business that you started. And that reason is usually very personal. And only you can tell that story. So when you tell the story, you're actually able to bring people in and you're able to answer your why, which helps people care. You're able to answer, why should we care for what you care? And with that, then you're able to bring resources on board your enterprise and uh, whether it is resources of money or resources of people to just pitch in and help you succeed better. You're on mute, Ja. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Kendi. And just as we also come to the end and look at the questions, um, from where you see it having been with the Microsoft and now uh, with Meta in the same uh, field of digital and, and business, um, from, from, from your perspective, um, have you seen African-owned businesses leverage technology for growth? And what does really success look like? Uh, maybe focus a lot on when we leverage it, when we are able to leverage on, 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 um, on, on technology, how does success really look like? Um, so have I seen that was already answered or spoken to women are slow to take it up globally and even slower in Africa, which is what we're trying to change. Um, what does success look like if you adopt technology? Really, the podcast that I did, share, I think I'll, I'll text them here. Listen to them. If you listen in, you're able to scale. When you when you're a founder, how much more can you scale? Think about technology is the one thing that helps you scale. It's the one that helps you um achieve economies or economies of scale and utilizing that today helps you gain the advantage that would not have been present previously and also if you want to gain the right talent which is the younger talent these days if you want to have the right people working for you you need to be a tech savvy company otherwise you don't attract your top most talent and you need that to keep succeeding so the right business in summary they're able to achieve scale because there's economies of scale because technology helps fast track that. Then two, you're able to have the right talent in. And three, there is the, cons the constant growth mindset that is deployed in the business. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kendi. And Kendi uh, runs uh, actually a girls and, and, and women uh, coaching program. 
uh, look for her and, and just try to get in touch. She has also shared a lot of helpful uh, links on the chat, uh, which I'm sure that uh, the team uh, behind the BASC are able to actually share and you can check them out for uh, continuous capacity building. At this point, we have a few questions and maybe we'll just go through some of them actually comments some are questions and thank you so much everyone for this kind of engagement uh, so hold on we have one question for you and um, um, the participant is asking how does microfinance institution ensure that customers pay especially for small uh, uh, SMEs who are not banking I'll read all the questions and then we can speak through them um, uh, one of the person uh, actually asking another question is uh, looking forward to the Nkwansi second launch and she's actually asking about, um, she says she lacks knowledge on how to pitch her business. Uh, maybe if you, I know when during the next section we can actually speak, uh, Angelus will speak to that, what are some of the initiatives that we have already put in place to ensure that we can mentor women to be able to pitch um, um, their businesses. The other question is um, a general question and she asks how women leverage technology to make their ideas into action. I think as Candy spoke, she's already alluded uh, to that but Kendi you may want to add something to that if uh, there is um, and then lastly uh, we have a question um, uh, uh, she says that we see that a majority of people on the course are eager to learn through online platforms uh, thank you Kendi for sharing uh, the provoking information and professional development we shall be uh, uh, sending the link to the noted platforms in the upcoming email. Uh, so I think this is just a note, uh, but to uh, hold on, I think you have a question and then um, Kendi, if you'd like to uh, make an additional uh, sentiment. Thank you so much, Jael. Um, so I will try to elaborate very short. And uh, so first of all, uh, it's very important that um, the staff that you hire are within the community that you're operating. Yes, uh, this is because they will know who is who. They can also um, and sh they can also leverage on the network that they have within that community. So for us, the most important is to always hire uh, people within the community that we are servicing. And then once the uh, credit officer is of course trained, they will always go on the field and visit the entrepreneur. Yes, does, does she or he uh, have a shop? Yes, and then visit that shop and also speak to the community around where the shop is. Yes, because sometimes what you get is that people apply on behalf of their brother or sister or uncle. Yes, so to ensure that whoever is applying um, in the name of that business is actual owner of that business. So it's fair, it comes to the very important to engage with the community that you're servicing. Furthermore, of course, there's all we require a guarantor. Yes, somebody. Uh, who will witness the, uh, the agreement between uh, us and the person that he or she knows, but who is able to also step in in case there is a default. So if the repayment is, let's say, $50 a month, the person who is guaranteeing uh, the, uh, the entrepreneur that we're financing has to be able to show a pay slip that either they're working or they're in business to show that they're able to cover uh, uh, if there's in case of there's any default. Furthermore, of course, everything is notarized. Yes, you go to a notary to notarize everything. Um, uh, rules and regulations in this country are not yet uh, working appropriately. Uh, so the, if you go to court, it will take a lot of time. But because there's a trust within the community, what we do is we notarize and also always get a, gar uh, a guarantor to witness the transaction. So I, I hope that uh, assists. Thank you so much, Hodan. Kendi, uh, do you want to add something on these participants who say how can they put their ideas into action? How, or, can, they, how can they put their ideas into action? Yes. Um, okay, so of the resources that I've given you, there's so much that you can use from there. Please explore. You'll be able to see where from where to start and how, how to get on. And some of the um, like the Google bits, those are usually incubating 
uh, platform. So you can actually go in and ideate and be work, be helped to come from idea to end of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kendi. At this point, I would like to give uh, uh, 30 seconds to each one of you for a parting shot uh, as we come to the end of the session, to the end of the first session. Uh, can we start with you, Hicksonia? Because you are the first person. Thank you, Jal. I, I think the, the thought that I would love to leave behind is it is now time for action in terms of upskilling women to explore and leverage technology. And, you know, I started intentionally with the 102 years of International Women's Day. We should see beyond this point changes in terms of women accessing uh, digital technology to scale their businesses. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Hicks. Sonia, uh, to Fahad. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Jill. I think yeah, I think it, I thank everyone. It was a, a great session, um, and I think what what we've learned is that it, you know it makes sense uh, from a business perspective to include women and empower women within our value chain and across other agricultural value chains. Women are very hardworking, resilient and really are the backbone uh, of our communities. Um, and so we, we, we look forward to continuing uh, our work. Thank you so much, Fahad Hodan, your parting shots. Uh, Hodan, you are muted. I can't see an action from Hodan to Kendi. Yeah, I think Hodan is frozen. Um, a lot has been said. What I will say, which is really to anchor this, as women, let's remember we're the custodians of culture, the custodians of development, always have been. Previously, we did it out of tech. Now, tech is in every aspect of life. So if we choose not to engage in tech, what we are doing is choosing not to engage in the core aspect of what we do. So I'll invite you, please look at tech. It can be simple. It is simple, which is why I started with saying I incorporate it in my everyday life. Just incorporate it and you will be able to succeed and more move ahead. Thank you so much, Hicksonia. Thank you so much, Kendi. Thank you so much, uh, Hodan and, and Fahad, for taking your time to share your experiences, to share your stories, to just, you know, um, lay your life before uh, this, uh, this, 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 this audience uh, so that we can be able to learn from them. We really value you as really uh, African experts and, and really experienced people we can always uh, rely on on sessions like this one. Allow me to, on behalf of ACF, to say a big thank you and looking forward to engage with you again. So um, at this point, I would like to welcome my colleague, Angelus. And uh, part of this program, we actually launching our second call for, we are, we are do, we're launching our second call for our Nkwansi uh, Scaling Women SME, Women SMEs uh, program that is actually looking at, um, uh, looking at, uh, um, you know, building uh, more businesses so that we have more women that are commercially viable and can be able to access financing. Um, uh, this time is for you, Angelus. Thank you very much, Jael, and happy International Women's Day to all the women and all the ladies in this call. Um, we have this amazing opportunity um, to introduce to you Nkwansi. Um, This will be our second call. Um, we did our first call last year, and I think it is essentially at the cusp of every conversation we've had today, uh, essentially around digital learning and innovating around um, digital um, innovation, digital experiences. Um, so I have a brief presentation, and then I will invite uh, two um, two women SMEs um, who are currently part of our first cohort to just share their experience. So 
allow me to just share my presentation and introduce to you Nkwanzi. So Nkwanzi is uh, women, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a women in leadership program, essentially in partnership with the AFDB and our, our project. Uh, we conceived this project around scaling women SMEs um, and, and that is in essence all we want to talk about in this session. And it, it literally, it, it, it literally just embodies every conversation I've had today from building an equal uh, an equal treatment um, for unequals, um, ensuring that um, all you can tell is a story that people can believe in, and, and a lot more, especially around the digital content. So as AECF, we're coming from a place of seeing it um, in real life, that women no longer, or for, for the longest time, have not had um, capacity in terms of presenting themselves to financial institutions, telling their story in the right way, and being able to even access financial instruments that speak to them. But there's the other side where it's it's been a perception where we must, women have a higher risk when you invest in them, or that female entrepreneurs are generally um, perceived to be smaller businesses, and, and we want to break these barriers. So as ACF, we put together this project essentially to start breaking this barrier. So Nkwanzi is established as a women-focused investment readiness program, essentially to do two things. One, unlock the potential of women-led enterprises, and two, support them in unlocking um, capital that they require to, to support their enterprises. And, and we envision to do this in a couple of ways. And, and what we have is a women-centered mentorship, coaching, investment readiness support um, that also filters into facilitating conversation with investors. Uh, we're currently working with the Africa Guarantee Fund on the supply side, uh, working with financial institutions across Sub-Sahara um, to help them understand what it means to invest um, in women enterprises across the continent. So the program is structured um, over about six to seven months, dependent on your pace as, as a learner. Um, it is a purely virtual um, program and some elements may be physical, but it's purely a virtual program. Um, so as soon as you get into the program, going through eligibility, uh, you will have to do a screening that allows us to understand how far or how close you are um, to being investor ready and engaging with investors. Uh, we then introduce you to um, content at the launch stage that allows you to um, learn independently, pace yourself and be able to go through different uh, levels of content around business viability, around financial viability, around constructing your organization in the right way. And, and finally, around starting to think about what it means to fundraise and engage investors. Um, at the end of this process, you will engage with a tool that also begins to measure whether you've actually made progress in that journey. And after that, if you meet uh, certain criteria, you are then progressed to the growth stage. In the growth stage, um, it is uh, essentially group coaching where we group, um, we, we bring together women, uh, the, the enterprises uh, with similar attributes um, to learn together, to share from each other and understand uh, and, and even contribute to each other's growth, as well as understand where others have failed and where others have acceded and, and how to just use all of that experience for their growth. At the end of that stage, we'll then introduce another assessment that allows us to know which is the right path for you in fundraising. Are you seeking debt? Are you seeking equity type of capital? Are you just seeking grants or what other kind of capital would be ideal for your business? And at this particular point, we'll assign a coach, an independent coach for you and mentor to walk the journey with you. So we anticipate this progress, uh, this to progress into um, active fundraise for all the companies we support. Um, so we are envisioning that as a follow up to the second call, we will be introducing all applicants to the self-directed content in, in the month of March and into April. Um, thereafter, we'll get into the group coaching from May all the way to July. 
and the one-on-one -on -one coaching from August and into December will just be focused on fundraising for the women enterprises. So you must be wondering, what should you have to qualify for this um, pro program? Essentially, we expect that your business is woman-owned, woman-led. So, and, and this for us means at least 50%, more is better, but at least 50% of the business is, is woman-owned. Um, you've been operating for two years. It does not need to be formally registered business, but we need that you have been operating for two years and you're able to provide documentation to, to, to just prove that. And you're operating in nine of the four, in, in, in any of the nine focus countries that we have um, for the program, which is Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Kenya, Liberia, Mali, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Um, in terms of sectors, we have some primary sectors, even though it's more agnostic, um, but focused on agribusiness, renewable energy, financial services, education, water, sanitation, technology, um, as well as healthcare. Um, if you are at least generating revenues of 50,000 or anticipate to generate to generate revenues of 50,000 this year, we'd definitely like to hear from you. We'd like to see your experience. We'd like to see what your business is about. Um, and, and you must be ambitious in terms of looking for funding. Um, the minimum we want to consider is $10,000. And we are open to support companies that are looking for up to $5 million. So there's no limitation in terms of how much you're making and how much you're looking for. But our sweet spot is between $10,000 and, and uh, $5 million. So we are looking forward and ready to support you with that. So in terms of what you can expect from the program, um, as an initial benefit, we will run business clinics to uh, the women enterprises that will have applied uh, or will apply within the month. And this is an initial screening just to, just to give you initial advice, just to give you a sense and a taste of what it means to go through the program. Um, we will begin to address the barriers of accessing finance. And, and this is by introducing practical tools and templates. And the entire content that you will go through, which is in total about 31 learning areas, introduce different tools and, and, and processes and systems that you can embed and, and work with in your business. Um, the platform allows you to bring in your team. So it's not just the CEO or the, or the proprietor who is in the platform that's benefiting, it is it is accessible with by teams and, and dependent on the conversation you're having, you can bring in different teams and get you to a place you are investor ready. Um, again, storytelling is almost the beginning of every investment readiness journey. Are you able to tell investors, including financial institutions that you're approaching, even for a simple uh, debt instrument? Um, can you tell them your story? Can you tell them what you're going to use the funds for? Can you tell them what they can expect in terms of getting their money back? And these are some of the things that we essentially go through. Access to finance, we will host uh, boot camps. And, and these boot camps essentially is um, the coming together of the demand side and the supply side. And here referring to the providers of capital being in the same room with you as an entrepreneur. And, and sharing ideas and opportunities of what it means um, to have the right structure and the right instrument and the right process for your enterprises to access money. Um, we'll do this at the country level, so it becomes easier to engage even the financial institutions. And then given it's, it's a virtual and digital learning experience, we have embedded a lot of peer and networking engagements and and this refers to forums that you will have access to and, and even just on a on a general dashboard just being able to engage uh, peers you can do this per sector you can do this per country um, we don't really define how how diverse it needs to be but as you see you can draw experience from different countries we invite you to actually initiate a conversation there are conversations that we start as as the coordinators of the project but we also invite you to continually be creating and initiating um, such connections. And 
Last but not least is meetup and events, um, investor connections. Um, so we will have many of these. At the moment, we have a bi-weekly check-in with um, the current cohort, just checking how they are doing in the platform, trying to answer any question that in an, is unanswered. And soon we will be introducing coaches to the existing cohort. And, and I think this is where the rubber starts to meet the road, um, answering those tough questions and, and beginning to shape your business in a way that you can actually present it to investors. So, of course, you must be wondering what next? What can I do to be a part of this uh, experience? And, and for us, it's very simple. We'll provide a link, um, but essentially it begins with registering for the ACF Academy. Um, so I invite you to hit that link, um, and join the ACF Academy. We look forward to engage with you. And thank you very much uh, for, for, for just listening to this presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to pause my presentation here so that you can begin to hear the experiences of, of the existing companies in, in, the, in the platform. Um, and allow me to invite Farisai um to just share experience welcome farisai thank you very much hi there i am farisai muluki and i'm an aecf and kwanzi investee as well as co-founder of hcczt my company's other co-founder is my husband tokmo muluki i'm going to try to speak with you about two things firstly what inspired me to participate in Nkwanzi? And secondly, how I apply my new learning to our business strategy, especially since Nkwanzi trains us to create new documents for our portfolios. Before we get into it, a word of welcome. Happy International Women's Day 2023. This is an important commemoration and I'll join the conversation just to say, Mother Nature is the great messenger. And this natural digital photograph of clouds and light behind me here depicts something very, very special. It depicts a woman dancing with tears of joy. And it represents one of Mother Nature's messages to us. And that message is, women rejoice. Because no matter what problems we face, the future always looks bright. <laughs> Remember, the way we see the problem is the problem, to quote one wise person. So let's try to change the way we see our problems in order to find permanent solutions to them. This picture is called Chiratizo, Heavenly Sign, and it was photographed by Tokumo Muruki in 2015. Now to my two main points. Number one, what inspired me to participate in Nkwanzi? Well, I used to access the African Union and the SADC websites looking for work-related opportunities. And at the end of last year, I came across an attractive link to the Nkwanzi platform it was very easy to access and very easy to use. And I felt right at home with Nkwanzi. It was like looking in the mirror because the site really described the experience that I felt I was having with our company in terms of the struggle to grow and to access resourcing. I was grateful to be accepted onto the program. Number two, how do I apply my new learning well, what I've learned from Nkwanzi is that with the flexible, self-directed learning, you are trained to focus your business strategy from the inside out. And the information is applicable to your everyday life as well. So what stays with me for now is the business model canvas. Nkwanzi is a warm, friendly, fun, professional program. I love it because it is truly rewarding. We get to meet new colleagues and excellent administrators in the academy. Happy International Women's Day 2023. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Farisai. 
um, very inspirational. And I actually do hope that our listeners today are just as inspired as you are. Um, so thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to invite, I mean, Anneli um, to share her experience and, and hopefully and high inspiration. Welcome, Amin. Well, hello, everyone. Happy International Women's Day again. And my name is Amin Anle, and I'm here representing Green Sea and Energy PLC. And we are based in Ethiopia, which a company which can distribute solar products to off-grid rural communities of Ethiopia. And I work there as a business developer. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is about how my participation in the program impacted the company. And our objective to apply for the call was to enhance the company visibility and access the capacity building pro programs on the fundraising so that we could attract investment. And the experience so far with the project was very supportive in a way that we were able to assess the company in its investment readiness. And we were also able to make some changes using the materials uploaded in the ACF Academy. Um, specifically for greensing, the gender action plan, fundraising plan templates, and data room preparation has been very informative for us. Uh, the other thing is the resource on the platform was a great way to grow once a startup in a way that it can save your time to prepare all the formats and so on. Aside from the academy platform, the networks in there were also wide enough to reach people from various backgrounds, and uh, but with similar uh, interpersonal mindsets. Different opportunities and articles were also shared, which was one of the other reasons to, to stay in the program. And all the lessons were applicable and shows areas we need to improve to continue strengthening and growing the team. Thank you, ACF and Nikwanzi, and all the mentors, developers, and funders who made this possible. I personally, I personally would recommend Nikwanzi Scaling Women in CMEs program to unlock your potentials. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Amen. And I would have said a round of applause to both Amen and Parisai. I mean, if you were all in a meeting room, it would be. Thank you very much. Um, so I think without further ado, I would like to announce that the second call for Nkwanzi is now live. Um, we, the link has been shared on chat. And you are invited and welcome to submit your application. We look forward to engage with you in the business clinics over the month of March. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, uh, we have a few minutes for that, yes. Uh, Angelas, um, um, one of the questions is around eligibility criteria, so maybe you can respond to that. Um, question here, 2000 annual revenue may be a bit niche. Is there flexibility in the criteria? Um, thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Um, in terms of the eligibility criteria, I can quickly reshare my screen and go back to the eligibility criteria. Um, the focus for us is identifying women enterprises that are at least two years in their operating cycle and in operating in nine of any one of the nine focus countries that we have highlighted. In terms of sectors, we are pretty much agnostic, um, even though we've listed some of the um, sectors where we'd like to see applications. In terms of revenues, um, generating revenues of at least $50,000, and that is in the previous year, or you're planning to, or have significant confidence you can generate $50,000 in revenues this year. 
Um, so I hope that answers both questions, Gladys. Uh, one other question is around limit of countries to participate. Yeah, thank you. That's an interesting one. Um, and fortunately, as a result of this being a pilot project with a AFAWA program, um, we're only limited to these nine countries. However, as a result of continued interest, there is potential, even though no guarantees, but there is potential for uh, another round. And I'd request that you keep an eye out if you are not in operating in any of these nine countries at the moment. Uh, a final question would be for those who have led in the first four, what is there need for them to reapply again? Um, yes, if you did make it through the first cohort and your business has now achieved um, the milestone that did not allow you to progress, we look forward to receiving your application again. Uh, do we have time for one more question or it's on top of the how? Because there's one last question around is the application on Kwanzaa an extension of the application submitted for investing in women in the blue economy in Kenya? Um, I'll take that as the last question and then we can wrap it up. Um, the straight answer is no. Um, these are two separate um, programs. So the ACF and Kwanzaa program is separate from the investing in women in the blue economy program. So if you are interested in both, then you are supposed to make applications to both. All right, thank you very much, Gladys. And thank you everyone for your presence and your participation. Um, we do look forward to continue engaging with you through the applications. Um, feel free to send us an email. Um, we just put down our email address in kwanzi at acfafrica.org. Um, and happy International Women's Day. Um, thank you very much uh, to everyone. And do have a good evening or afternoon, depending on where you're sitting across the continent. All right. Bye-bye.